This is not a test. On this Looking at Lyme, we head all the way to Munich, Germany, and to meet a doctor who is on the leading edge of testing for Lyme and other infections. Come along for the ride. We're going to meet Dr. Armin Schwartzbach. Dr. Armin Schwartzbach has been studying diagnostic tests for Borrelia burgdorferi and co-infections for over 15 years. In that time, he has tested over 50,000 patients. He's one of the leading experts on Lyme disease testing and other pathogens. He joins us from Munich. Welcome, Armin, to our podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Hello, how are you? I'm here in Germany, sitting in a hot atmosphere. <laughs> uh, Armin, how did you become involved in working with Lyme disease and other tick-borne illnesses? To make a longer sh uh, story short, I diagnosed a so-called multiple sclerosis patient in 2004-2005, and um, I did a special test for this patient. It was uh, named the Elispot or lymphocyte transformation test that time, and the patient was without any antibodies, nothing in the bloodstream, suffering from uh, multiple sclerosis, treated with corticosteroids, nearly dying, sitting in a wheelchair, um, no possibility to get healthy again. I did this test on her and I was surprised that she was positive for Borrelia burgdorferi, the pathogen for Lyme disease. And after that, the doctor called me, a therapist. Oh, could it be maybe neuroboliosis? And I said, I don't know, because multiple sclerosis, multiple sclerosis, and neuroboliosis, neuroboliosis. But um, uh, he treated her by my advice, by these findings in this test without antibodies, and no antibodies in spinal fluid, no antibodies in the bloodstream. And the patient uh, is cured until now days. Uh, so this was a lucky case and it changed completely uh, my medical world completely. Oh, I can imagine that just knocked you on a new traje trajectory. And then, so how did you then become involved in laboratory work and improving the testing? Yeah, because because I saw in this um, that um, the antibodies are not um, reliable. Uh, antibodies, ELISA is, is worst case scenario, don't trust in ELISA, it's around 15% sensitivity, we name it, so very, very often, uh, very common uh, false negative. The Western blot, forget the Western blots, what is it telling the Western blots? It's a screening test for uh, transmission of Borrelia burgdorferi, but no activity test. And so when I started with this, I came to the cellular analytical um, part of laboratory medicine. I'm in laboratory now for 40 years. So I worked in biochemistry and, but I, I never have seen such cases where no antibodies, uh, but cellular immune reactions. Oh, that's so fascinating. So why do people send their blood to you uh, in Germany for testing? How would that testing be different compared to what we have here in Canada? In Germany, I have some, you would say, competitors or other laboratories offer, offering similar tests or maybe same tests. So um, this was not clear that time to me that some are caring also in Germany uh, for this project. Um, so I'm not alone offering this cellular analytics in, in Germany. But in other countries, when I traveled around and uh, people contacted me, contacted me patients for getting this test, nobody is doing the test in, in Canada or in, in Australia or in, in South Africa or in many other European countries very surprisingly. And so what is the difference between direct and indirect testing? Yeah, direct test is um, you need to get a biopsy from a bullseye rash as an example. You isolate the pathogen, in this case, for Burgdorferi, and you do a culture on it and you do a PCR on it. This is a direct test. You find directly the pathogen. It's, it's similar to SARS-CoV-2 swaps PCR. Okay, but if you do an indirect test, this is the part of humoral and cellular immune responses. This is a part of antibodies and T cellular immune responses. That's different. This is indirect detection of pathogens in the bloodstream, which is easy to do. Oh, and then what is the difference between B cells and T cells and how those impact the immune response or the antibody response? 
cells are the antibodies and the T cells are the lymphocytes. Uh, antibodies are proteins. Um, lymphocytes are living cells, living individuals fighting against pathogens. And in the whole diagnostic world, I think they are underrepresented. So nobody is caring for cellular tests. Um, we have some tests for tuberculosis. It's named the Quantiferon test. This is astonishingly, it's um, a CDC um, preferred test. This India from gamma release assay, but for Lyme disease, this is as an example, not accepted. Very interesting. Okay. Can you help me understand, because I always find this part confusing, what is the difference between IgG and IgM? Yeah, these are both markers for systemic infections. So if a pathogen is penetrating your body, normally you should produce IgM antibodies, the antibodies of the first phase of your immune answer uh, of your um, humoral, the Th2 immune system. Um, after a while, you produce IgG antibodies, um, which are um, long-term antibodies. So the half-life time of these antibodies is different. The IgG can persist over months, years, and the IgM just for a very few weeks. But interestingly, in Lyme disease, we have persistencies of IgM antibodies for years without IgG antibodies. Okay. So, and we also interviewed uh, Dr. Leona Gilbert from Finland in episode 14. So she was speaking to us about your Tickplex test. And it's it was really exciting to hear that you can test for so many different microbes. Could you tell our listeners a little bit more about the Tickplex? Yeah, this uh, a longer story. Also, um, the Tickplex was developed because we saw together with Professor Gilbert um, that we have persistent forms, round bodies of Borrelia burgdorferi, and intracellular persistent forms. Some name it cysts or L forms or pleomorphic forms, however you want to name these round bodies. And we sat together in a, in a in a sauna, in a Finnish sauna, <laughs> drinking some beer. It's it's some years ago. <laughs> Yes, it was 2000, I don't remember exactly, 2012 or so. We said, why should we not test for these persistent form antibodies? Why not? And that was a breakthrough because we found around 98% now with a persistent form antibodies. And by this, Leon Gilbert, uh, she's a medical, uh, sorry, a test producer, professional. I'm a medical professional. Um, I helped her in, in with patients and uh, she did this Tickplex test. And the Tickplex has uh, also really a very interesting point. We found also that all of these patients that multiple infections, so-called co-infections from tick bites or reactivated infections, we name it opportunistic infections, viruses, and so on. So she designed a panel for that, uh, for these co-infections, the first ELISA in the world. The ELISA technique is more sensitive than uh, IFA, immune fluorescence assays, much better test. We like that test in our laboratories. So uh, she developed also a broad range uh, 20 IgG, IgM together, a combination for chlamydia, for mycoplasma, for uh, Epstein-Barr virus, for Bartonella rickettsia, all of these co-infections, Ehrlichia. Uh, so why not uh, to check for patients with uh, such a, a, a test panel? Because we find in every patient multiple infections. There's not one patient um, I, I diagnose with just Lyme disease. They all have different infections or they don't have Lyme disease at this moment. They have other co-infections or other opportunistic infections. So why not to check for multiple infections? And then I've heard you refer to both co-infections and opportunist, opportunistic infections. What is the difference between those and how they manifest in the body? Yeah, the co-infections are, uh, don't name it co-infections, I don't like this word, mm. I like more uh, infection or tick-borne diseases, infections coming from a tick bite, vector-borne uh, infections, uh, these is Bartonella, 
This is uh, Elichiana plasma, this is Babesia, and this Rickettsia, the, the big four ones. Also, we have now Borrelia Maya Motoi, number five. Um, this is directly transmitted by a pathogen, by a vector, these pathogens. Um, the opportunistic infections mean uh, we have them in our bodies. As an example, the herpes on your lips or the blisters in your mouth, which can be a Coxsackie virus infection, very, very common in Canada. Uh, interestingly, um, I think it's the same percentage as we find Lyme disease in Canada or more. Um, you have different uh, reactivations of this um, normally immune controlled viruses or chlamydia, mycoplasma, which makes some sinusitis, some slime production, biofilms also intracellular. So we need to differentiate. Um, it's not enough to say this is Lyme disease because symptoms are not specific for Lyme disease. Now, feel free to dodge this question, but I have to ask, why do companies, countries and the medical profession continue to use flawed tests? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, they don't accept chronic infections. In all of the years, I have learned that uh, I accept chronic infections, chronic Lyme, chronic Bartonellosis, chronic rickettsiosis, but the majority of doctors don't accept this. They say, yes, uh, you can have a, um, a current, a recent infection, a fresh infection, but it cannot get chronic. This is um, the struggle we have politically with this society is doing the guidelines. So um, what I'm fighting for the acceptance of chronic infection and this we can do by this wonderful blood test like the tick blacks, tick blacks basic, tick blacks plus, the early spots, also the natural killer cells are helpful. We can do from bloodstream. We cannot um, do biopsies. We cannot do surgery from nerves. We cannot do surgery from brain to do biopsies to do the direct test for the pathogen by culture and PCR, it's impossible. And then I know this year you've been really busy, uh, your laboratory has been very busy testing for COVID. And I also saw on your website that you have therapists that are using the Armin lab tests for clinical sero serological monitoring for COVID patients. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I'm, I like the infections. I like the viruses in, in diagnosing them in general. It's not just uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this is my specialty for years and my, my clinical time in the early 90s, I was clinical infectious disease consultant for a while. So I know how to handle clinically with the symptoms and I'm a medical doctor too. So um, what I see in this um, model with the three eyes with this uh, SARS-CoV-2. We diagnose it with antibodies, IgG, IgA, very, very interesting marker, the IgA. I would like that for Borrelia burgdorferi, the IgA antibodies, local inflammatory antibodies, IgG, IgM are not representing localized infections, inflammation. Um, and the Second, the uh, second I is the uh, immune dysfunction. So I like immunology to offer some tests for that. And the last three I we need to diagnose and treat in all of these infections, not just SARS-CoV-2, is the inflammation, the inflammatory markers. We can do some cytokines, TH1, TH2. So we have good chances um, in laboratory also to help therapists and um, to 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 give additional information about infection, inflammation, and immune dysfunction. Oh, that must be so helpful to be see those to see those changes in their patients. Are you? Yes, yes. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Also, the therapists need to do that. It's it's not just enough to say I do now my antibodies or my for for SARS-CoV-2 we have the also the I spot. It's called. We can differentiate between. Um, past infection and currently active infection with interleukin-2. We have the same test um, also now for Borrelia burgdorferi, the eye spot it's named with interleukin-2. But nevertheless, a test never can exclude anything, please. Um, a neurologist can never exclude uh, neurobolioses, never. There's no test in the world ex uh, for excluding exclusion. We can say uh, it's a high sensitivity, it's high specificity, but we need to think clinically, we need to to accept that the patient is telling you for Lyme disease or other infections. Are you seeing people test other tissues from the body as well? Yes. Um, in Europe, we have this acrodermatitis, which is a very dry skin 
on the hands, as an example, we can do biopsies and we can check for Borrelia burgdorferi in that um, with a pathologist and also PCR specialist. But nevertheless, the uh, to prove it in the tissue is also not 100% sensitive. So we have a lot of false negatives there. It's not so easy to diagnose by PCR. You have also learned from SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so um, there's no 100% guarantee. But if you have a tissue biopsy or do surgery, uh, you can do the, the hip as an example, if you have a hip replacement, you can uh, send laboratories some uh, parts of the bone, which has the arthritis and then the arthrosis. And then we can try to find out Borrelia and other pathogens. Oh, it really sounds like you're pushing the boundaries there. Uh, I just have one more question. I'm curious about, are you seeing any correlation between COVID and Epstein-Barr virus or any other infections? Yes, I have developed, um, because I'm coming from this opportunistic um, field, uh, so I work with HIV patients, the same situation as you have here, uh, we have here with the uh, SARS-CoV-2 patients, immune suppression and so, and they, a lot of these HIV patients have not problems with HIV, they have problems with these opportunistic infections, EBV, CMV, cytomegalovirus, Coxsackie virus, echovirus, uh, also herpes simplex virus, HHV6, HHV7, HHV8. Uh, so they have a lot of virus uh, problems, also yeast and mold, because they're immune suppressed. And we have this exactly the same model in SARS-CoV-2. Therefore, I developed an opportunistic checklist for that. It's not a Lyme disease checklist for also long COVID um, to find out clinically which symptoms are EBV symptoms, which symptoms are parvovirus, B19 symptoms, also a heart rhythm problem virus. It's not just all uh, Borrelia burgdorferi doing heart rhythm problems. Um, so you can differentiate. It costs nothing. You can download on website or I can send you. And then clinically, you can differentiate which infection might be active in which long COVID patient. Um, and I, I did this successfully with a lot of patients and we find a lot of EBV, epstein barr virus reactivations. And interestingly, last uh, sentence to that, uh, one, two weeks ago, there came studies um, about that. I think 30% of long COVID uh, patients might have reactivations of epstein barr viruses, but EBV. So, but these groups are not checking for other viruses. This is what um, I cannot accept. Um, normally you should check for multiple infections. All of these patients have several viruses active. It's not just one. So we need to come more to chronic multiple reactivations of this normally immune controlled viruses. Wow. And I mean, just compiling all of that data and analyzing it must be such an important part. What is next in testing? Yeah, what is next? Um, the next chapter, um, I would like to have a biofilm test. <laughs> Uh -huh. to say because, uh, yeah, we have a lot of biofilm discussions with Borrelia, Lyme disease, and also Chlamydia, Mycoplasma, Yersinia, Campylobacter, whatever. So we need biofilms because they are communication areas and we need some tests for that, I'm sure. Um, also, what is coming next? I'm in the parasites now working more and more. We don't have so many good tests for parasitical infections, Toxocaracanis, very common together uh, with Lyme disease, with neuropsychiatric symptoms, or Ascarisum, uh, which has to do with the dogs and the cats and your domestics, as an example, mm -hmm. to eat up the eggs. So I'm more in the field now, also parasites, viruses, other bacteria, gut viruses, very, very interesting. Everybody has a um, problem I diagnosed with Lyme disease with the gut, and nearly all in Canada have Coxsackie virus, Echovirus, double infection, so you need to treat the virus. Also, you need to treat the gut, the natural immunity. Um, also a challenge uh, will be uh, the gut bacteria. And where I'm not so strong, where we need more tests and also uh, more input uh, is the yeast and mold field in the world. Wow. Well, that was absolutely incredible. I just want to thank you so much for joining us on our podcast and uh, teaching all of our listeners this complicated part of, uh, of Lyme disease diagnostics. <laughs> thank you, Armin. Thank you, Sarah, so much. And um, uh, don't uh, fear a tick, you know, don't fear a tick bite. We have good chances to diagnose nowadays and also good treatment options. Um, the mistakes are not done from our side. Yeah, that's a really great point. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, so much. Have a nice day.
Dr. Armin Schwarzbach has been studying diagnostic tests for Borrelia burgdorferi and co-infections for years. We reached him in Munich, and I'm sure glad we did. It was so interesting to hear him explain the difference between co-infections and opportunistic infections, and also to learn about the different forms of Borrelia, such as the persister form. That's another podcast of Can Limes Looking at Lyme. Thank you for listening, and remember, stay safe in the outdoors.